Now, it might not have occurred to you uh, that here in this country we have gone through something of a kind of uh, counter-revolution to the point where uh, culture wars have taken the place of an awful lot of what used to be considered to be reasonable conversation. There are certain things that you now cannot say. There are certain things that you now cannot think. And there are certain things that, are, as far as uh, some people are concerned, uh, you shouldn't even have occurred to you. But let us talk now uh, about an organisation called Counterweight, because this is Helen Pluckrose's idea. Uh, let's find out what it's all about. Helen, a very good afternoon to you. Hello, lovely to be here. Yes, thank you very much indeed for joining us. What made you uh, come up with this idea, first of all? Because I think it's uh, it's long overdue, to be honest. After uh, the death of George Floyd and the BLM pro uh, protest, there was just so many emails, all of us in this space who have been concerned about critical social justice approaches were getting panicked emails from people who were having to do really quite um, authoritarian um diversity training and affirm right. things they didn't believe so there were so many we set up a discord server so we could triage the most urgent cases give generalized advice and counterweight has formed out of it our project coordinator worked um in the past in the citizens advice bureau right. and so she's applied a lot of the similar methods to it to a caseworker system and it's um it's working it's yeah. working really well we <laughs> And sort of, and, and what sorts of um, advice can you give? I mean, say for example, I was reading uh, some of the stuff that you've, you've you've dealt with in the past, where, for example, um, you know, some organisations have have become sort of overrun by people apologising for things that it's not really their fault to apologise for. You know, like people sending emails to their bosses complaining that you know they feel guilty about something that happened in the past. You know, statues have been taken down as a result. You know, this kind of thing, and it does seem to have changed the way we live, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think people have a right to believe this if um, if people do feel guilty about their race or their sex and they believe themselves to have been socialised into um, white supremacist or patriarchal beliefs or, or whatever else, they have the right to believe that. What they don't have the right to do is insist that other people believe that. Mm. The people we hear from mostly are um, white people who don't believe that they're racist and don't want to affirm that they are, and um, black and South Asian people who don't want to be um, forced to testify to a very theoretically specific experience of racism. So we're a liberal humanist organisation. We believe as liberals that people can evaluate ideas and re reject or accept them. Right. And what has happened, do you think, to the people uh, in society who would have previously kind of defended basically what you're defending, which is the, the right to have a series of, of, of personal thoughts, a, a series of personal beliefs, which you don't necessarily want to preach to people every Saturday at Speaker's Corner, but which you want to be able to hold dear to yourself without somehow being criticised or, or worse, being painted as some kind of mad extremist. That's, that's what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing a loss of liberalism, that, that idea of that respect for the marketplace of ideas, the idea of plurality. We can coexist while having different approaches right. to things. And this, I, I mean, I've looked at the scholarship. There are, um, you know, other uh, sociologists have looked at what social changes, why, why is this happening? I recommend um, the coddling of the American mind um, and the rise of victimhood culture they're both very relevant but I've looked at the scholarship and the activism and what's coming out of the universities and it's really very much based at the moment on a Robin D'Angelo approach or a queer theory approach where it really is believed that by not believing um, the right ideas about these invisible systems of power and privilege um, you are perpetuating oppressive systems. You have to say the right things um, to fix things. We, discourses are dangerous. So if you mustn't sort of suggest that woman is a biological category, um, because otherwise you're, you are contributing to an environment that kills trans women. Yes. This is a belief now. This is something that I've noticed actually on social media, that now if you have, for example, 
um, a view about anything, you're accused of causing harm. That seems to be a tactic that certain people now use because they've worked out that it's not enough to disagree with you or to try and stop you saying something. They now try and make an accusation which you can't possibly really defend because it's so sort of ethereal. It doesn't it doesn't really exist in the real world. I mean, I've been told by, for example, sort of what I regard as rather radical cyclists uh, who want the entire world, you know, turned into a massive cycle lane and cars to be banned, that I somehow, by criticising the imp imposition of cycle lanes in London, uh, that I'm somehow encouraging people to do harm to cyclists, which, of course, is rubbish. <laughs> OK, right? well, uh, we might disagree on cycling, but generally, I think, um, yeah, the, the idea is that reality is socially constructed in discourses by ways of speaking about things. And if you truly believe this, and I think we have to accept that so social justice activists and scholars really do believe this, then speech really does do harm. Mm. If somebody like JK Rowling with a big platform says that she believes woman is a biological category, then there's going to be a massive flashback. And if we look at how it happened with people saying, chanting the mantra back, trans women are women, trans women are women, trans women are women, because of this focus on language, we have to undo the harm done by certain language and replace it with better language. And this, this doesn't work with the liberal marketplace of ideas or with the conservative no. respect for personal authority or, you know, with uh, religious beliefs in free will. So it, it's... But it's a it dangerous little. Secularized. It's a dangerous <laughs> rocky road, isn't it? Because you know, while there are some things that you would prefer, that, 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 that I suppose that, that the law would protect you against, for example, people using hate speech against other people. You know that. But the trouble is, is hate speech has now become expanded into all kinds of areas, hasn't it? I think hate speech is a very difficult. Um, I mean, obviously some speech is hateful, but how do you judge someone's um, feelings? I think the issue has to be harassment. Yeah. You know, are you forcing people to hear things they don't want to hear? Are right. you following them? Are you threatening them? Are right. you intimidating them? If you just believe something that they don't believe and that they that hurts them, you know, I'm I'm um, I'm an atheist. I I don't believe in God. Now this means that some people can be very very badly hurt by my beliefs, and historically, I would have been punished for them and and possibly killed. Yeah. So this is this is a very human thing, but we don't want to see a resurgence of it, and I, and I'm afraid we are. Yes, I know. And I mean, do you think it all started in the sort of hallowed halls of academia? Because it seems to me that that's where it began, but I don't know if that's right. That, yeah, that there is a feedback loop that goes on because it's significant that this started just as the liberal civil rights movement, gay pride, um, feminism had won their main legal battles. So this had had this; these had been won in the courts, but obviously racism, sexism, homophobia hadn't gone away. So what remained was to tackle attitudes. So scholars have focused on that postmodernism, the idea of um, that discourses and beliefs and knowledge as a social construct was very useful. So we have these, these different kinds of scholarship grow up, activists be, became able to use it, apply it to everything, and it's got deeply simplified into the things we see from people like Robin D'Angelo. If you are white, you are racist. You yeah. cannot help but be racist. Right. And what about the idea that somehow, um, interestingly, that you said you were an atheist, because I've, I've, I've read people writing that because of the kind of disappearance to a large extent of an awful lot of mainstream religion, that people have kind of latched onto this movement, as it were, because people inevitably want to belong to something. They want to be part of a group. They want to be something that they can associate with and, 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 and have people around them that agree with them, almost like if it was a religion. I think that critical social justice meets a lot of the same psychological and social needs that religion does. And yeah. this is why I think we need to apply the rules of secularism to it. You have the right to believe this, to express this, to live by this. Mm. You cannot force it on anyone else. There's a simplistic sort of substitution theory where some people claim that because religion is decreasing, social justice is increasing. But that doesn't work mm. geographically. Right. America 
uh, remains the most religious um, place in the Anglosphere, and it also has the most <laughs> critical social justice wokery. Yes. So it's not quite as straightforward all as that. But... All, uh, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, <laughs> interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit like when I look around in parts of, uh, of, of, of the city I live in where uh, pubs have been converted into places of worship you know, in a rather kind of bizarre twist, uh, which, which which we could probably talk about all day. But what do you think is, is going to happen, say, for example, Helen, in the next sort of 12 months or so? Because I sense, and I don't know whether you would agree with this, that while this is a massive problem and, it, and there has been a problem, you know, <coughs> relatively recently, it's not quite as big a problem as maybe it was in the summer of last year. I, from the input I'm getting, it's, still a significant problem we still have a lot of cases ongoing but i think that we're also seeing a lot of recognition of the problem mm. and we're seeing more and more people willing to push back so we have got quite a few of our members have got themselves onto equity diversity and inclusion boards where they are trying to keep um viewpoint diversity open and yeah. trying to avoid really narrowly social justice ideas we've got open whistleblowers obviously right. but a lot of people don't want to do that they don't want to punish anyone or cancel anyone they yeah. just want to make things a bit freer so I don't think things are getting better yet I think they might well get worse before they get better but I think that we the, the seeds are there hmm. for saying enough is enough you you've gone too far yeah. now we need some reason <laughs> and, I, and I know that you probably would need a bit more nuance than this, but say, for example, if somebody is, I don't know, going for a job interview and they, got off and they, and they get taken down this kind of road of, of, of woke questions and, and as a result, perhaps they don't get a job because they didn't say the right thing. What mm. recourse do they have currently, if any? Well, we're, we're speaking to um, various trade unions um, about this at the moment and lawyers, and it all seems to be quite vague. Yeah. But... Um, on, an, on an ethical level, we've had um, a couple of people who have just refused um, to, uh, to what well, one person that we're working with, he has refused to undergo unconscious bias training on right. the grounds that it's demeaning to him as a black man. So he has a little less danger of being called racist. Yeah. And um, yeah, he's told that this will be represented in his performance review and it will directly affect his income. This this isn't acceptable. It's no more acceptable than if a Christian employer were forcing a Muslim employee to pretend to believe that Jesus was the son of God or right. or something. It's right. also it's have a, a sort problem. of, you know, <laughs> a religious assembly every morning or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah. see how it is going to be very, very tricky in terms of legal uh, and, and, and sort of ethical work. How do people get in touch, Helen, if they need to? Uh, counterweightsupport.com is our website and in the middle up there if you're having an emergency there's get help otherwise there are a lot of resources that you can just access freely okay brilliant stuff well great to talk to you and good luck with the project i'm sure we'll be speaking again we may have to seek your guidance on one or two matters over the course of the year helen pluckrose editor of ario magazine co-author of cynical uh, theories and also uh, the setter upper uh, of counterweight as it's now called um, an organization which will operate as if it is a citizen's advice bureau uh, for people who are getting what you might regard as bullied because that's what it is sometimes by their employer uh, into having to either make certain statements or undergo certain training or undergo you know certain programming uh, in order to continue to work where they work because it's not that clear yet whether any of that stuff is in fact um, legal if it's happened to you we'd love to hear from you